In this video we're going to discuss polar decomposition, which is a special case of the singular value decomposition that we've been discussing in the last several videos, but applied to square matrices. So here is the SVD of a matrix A. It's U sigma V transpose, where in this case we're only assuming that A is real. The U and the V matrices are orthogonal, and the sigma matrix is of the same size and shape as the original matrix A, and it's a diagonal matrix with the singular values on the diagonal. So now let's take a look at the case when A is real, but also square, so it's N by N. And let's take a look at the singular value decomposition in that special case. So remember that V is orthogonal, therefore V transpose V is just equal to the identity matrix. So we can insert that into our SVD. So I'm going to rewrite A as U V transpose times V sigma V transpose. And we're going to take the blue portion here and the red portion and we're going to designate those as W and R. So in that way A, the original matrix, is going to be decomposed into a matrix W which is U times V transpose times R which is V times sigma times V transpose. We'll show that W is orthogonal. Makes sense, U and V are orthogonal, but we'll show that. And R, we'll show, is symmetric. Uh, just a little bit of notation confusion here. So we normally use R for a right triangular or upper triangular matrix. Here in this section only, I'm going to use R in the usual way that it's used in polar decomposition. So R is not a right triangular matrix as it has been in the other sections of the book. So let's take a look at W first. W is U times V transpose. U and V, again, both being orthogonal. So because they're orthogonal, U times U transpose and U transpose times U are just equal to the identity matrix, and the same is true of V. So if I multiply W times W transpose, but then use this relationship where W is equal to U V transpose, then I have UV transpose times the transpose of UV transpose. Remember that the transpose of the product of matrices is the product of the transposes of those matrices, but in reverse order. So the transpose of UV transpose is simply V transpose transpose, which of course is V times U transpose. Well, V transpose V, again, that's just equal to the identity matrix. So this is equal to U, U transpose, but again, that is also equal to the identity matrix. So indeed, the product of two orthogonal matrices in this way does produce a third orthogonal matrix, in this case, W. Okay, so that's taken care of. Now let's show that R is a symmetric matrix. So for it to be symmetric, R and R transpose have to be the same. R is defined as V sigma V transpose, so that would have to be equal to the transpose of V sigma V transpose. So once again, let's take the transpose of the right. So that's V transpose transpose, which is V times sigma transpose times V transpose. So we can see that in order for these two to be equal, sigma and sigma transpose have to be the same. Now remember what sigma is, it's a diagonal matrix. Now in the context of polar decomposition, it's a square diagonal matrix. So it will be the same as its transpose. So that is indeed the case, and therefore R is indeed symmetric. So W is orthogonal, and R is symmetric. So any real square A matrix can be decomposed in the product of an orthogonal matrix and a symmetric matrix. It also turns out that R is positive definite, in which case all of the eigenvalues are, are positive. Now remember that any matrix A has a singular value decomposition, and so because the polar decomposition is just a special case for square matrices, every square matrix also has a polar decomposition of this form. So all I've shown so far is the special case of the SVD applied for a real square matrix A. We don't want to have to get the full singular value decomposition in order to perform the polar decomposition. So let's see how we can get the W and the R directly. So let's start by taking the transpose of our original decomposition A is W times R. 
So by taking the transpose of that, A transpose is R times W transpose, remembering that R is symmetric, therefore R and R transpose are the same. So we have A transpose is R times W transpose. Then if we post multiply by A, which is equal to W times R, then we have that A transpose times A is equal to R times W transpose times that WR. But again, W is orthogonal, so W transpose times W is just the identity matrix. So we have R times R, so that's R squared. So A transpose times A is equal to the square of our symmetric matrix R. Now if you remember from an earlier section, we showed that the eigenvalues of the power of a matrix are just the power of the eigenvalues of that matrix, and the eigenvectors are the same for, in this case, R as well as R squared. So we can take advantage of, of those. All right, so the way we do this is we form the A transpose times A matrix, which will still be square, and that is R squared. We get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of R squared, A transpose times A. That'll be the squares of the lambdas, the eigenvalues of R squared. And then Q is the orthogonal modal matrix consisting of the eigenvectors of A transpose A as its columns, which of course will be mutually orthogonal. So we can diagonalize R squared according to our usual diagonalization procedure for a real symmetric matrix. Q transpose times R squared times Q will give us a diagonal matrix with its eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of R squared down the diagonal. So those are lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, through lambda n squared. Similarly, we can do the same thing for R itself. We can diagonalize R because that is also a symmetric matrix. Q transpose times R times Q will produce a diagonal matrix with its eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda n, down the diagonal. Now if we solve for R, we can get that R is equal to Q times our diagonal matrix consisting of the eigenvalues times Q transpose. So that is how we get R. The lambdas are the eigenvalues of A transpose A, and the Qs consist of the eigenvectors of the A transpose A. So essentially we have the eigenproblem for A transpose A that, that gives us all the components of our polar decomposition, as we'll see. Once we have R, we can take the inverse of R, pre-multiply A, and that will give us the W matrix. So we have the W, which is orthogonal, and we have the R, which is symmetric. Alternatively, we could write this A as the product of R bar times W. Remember before, we had A was W R. So this is just an alternative formulation of the polar decomposition, so instead of W times R, we have R bar times W. If we take the transpose, that's A transpose is equal to W transpose times R bar. And if we pre-multiply by A, which is R bar times W, then we have A transpose times R bar, W W transpose times R bar. The W W transpose, W is orthogonal, so that's the identity matrix. So this is just R bar squared. So remember before, we had that R squared was A transpose A, and now we have that R bar squared is A A transpose. So alternatively, we could do the eigenproblem for A A transpose instead of A transpose A and get the corresponding W and the R bar. There's no advantage one way or the other, but just so you can see the alternatives uh, that we have here. So just as any decomposition procedure allows us to take advantage of the decomposed form and the properties of those decomposed matrices, the same holds here. So our square matrix A is decomposed into a, an orthogonal and a symmetric matrix, which obviously have very nice properties and we can take advantage of those. And as I said at the outset, continuum mechanics is really where you'll see this polar decomposition used most commonly because the deformation gradient tensor usually denoted by F, is such that the W matrix in our polar decomposition is actually a rotation matrix, and the R is what's called the right stretch matrix. It's positive, definite, 
and of course symmetric. The R bar is also positive definite symmetric and we call that the left stretch matrix. So essentially the polar decomposition separates out the W which is a rotation and the R or the R bar which is a stretch. And you can do the stretch first then the rotation or the rotation first and then the stretch and that's reflected in these alternative formulations of the polar decomposition. And the fact that there are two such polar decompositions is consistent with the fact that we can do the linear transformation in either order in this case. Now the term polar decomposition comes from the fact that this is analogous to polar coordinates. Remember in polar coordinates you have an angle from the positive x-axis and then you have a distance from the origin. So there's a rotation and a stretch. And so in a sense the polar decomposition is accomplishing that same thing but now for tensors.